Okay. Um, looks like the video recorder I've been using all these years just doesn't work anymore. I tried to upgrade it and it's actually worse. That's typical. So we're back at Revelation 17 and I'm going to try to wrap this up as far as Anastasius goes. Because it turns out uh, I've now read the dissertation that was over here. When you click on Bleponton, see you click on a link here in the text and it takes you to the note and then you click on the note text the same word and it takes you back to the text okay um... this was on Anastasius and as I had said in previous uh, recordings there was a lady named uh, Fiona Nix wrote a dissertation on him back in 1998 and that's the link that you click on to read that dissertation and her chapter 4 is about his religious policy which is the focus of Revelation 17 8 because it's the trend of history from that point forward which is the same as the trend of history prior so it's a it's a real soap opera I mean I, I'm so embarrassed for Christianity because what they consider holy are the church fathers who are some of the worst people who ever lived and what they consider holy was Constantine who was one of the biggest jerks who ever lived and the Bible itself is not giving him a good report card because that's where Constantine dies and that word in Greek means abomination it's the same word that's used in Daniel 9 27 okay there's a Greek translation of the Hebrew okay so God's opinion is so different from what Christians say and what Christians say is based on um, a self-righteous oh, our version of the doctrine is the only version and everybody else is a heretic and the trouble is all the people saying that don't have the doctrine right a good Friday hello you could read Matthew 12 verses 40 and 41 and you know immediately it's going to be good Wednesday because if Christ rises on the first day of the week just search on that phrase in the Bible and he's three days and three nights in the grave then he died on Wednesday yeah and when you go through the Bible properly y you find out why and I did that already in my past plot that HTM it's not hard you don't even have to be a scholar to do it but you do have to read the Bible and, the, and the, the church fathers didn't they had this so messed up by the time even of Polycarp and Justin Martyr prior you have Justin Martyr who was a total jerk and you had Ignatius who was a worse jerk and then you have Polycarp who was an even bigger jerk I mean I'm not even sure that those three people's names are the real people who wrote so-called church father writings we got but they're awful like of polycarp it was said his good deeds saved him oh christ is chopped liver then i mean this is ridiculous how bad it was well it got even worse as time went on and by the time you get to this guy anastasius especially if you read that link in wikipedia you'll see how bad it was he couldn't figure out who should rule after him so he puts a secret note underneath a cushion and then calls in I forget the two, two of the folks that he thought maybe should succeed him and and he made a secret pact with God that if one of them sat on the cushion where he put the note that's supposed to be who God wants to rule so what did God have him do neither one of the kids sat in that cushion and they thought oh well, I'm gonna put this is like Gideon with the fleece okay Gideon was a real jerk that's what the purpose of that story of Gideon with the fleece was is because he was a real jerk he became a real he was a real jerk he finally became a good believer and then he went back to being a real jerk that's the story of Gideon in the Bible read it yourself Okay, starts out apostate, he ends up apostate, but in the middle he had a good time. Well, Anastasius is like this too. And when he didn't get the right answer from God, which he could have known if he actually read the Bible what to do, 
he didn't get the right answer with God the first time, then he goes and does some other cockamamie thing. And it's in this Wikipedia article. I don't know where else to find it. I'm sure that it's probably in Theophanes, because Theophanes wouldn't have liked Anastasius. So it might be in Theophanes, it might be in one of the other contemporary writers, I have to go look it up. But you can at least find more detail in that dissertation, which is right here. All right. So what am I going to say now to close this out about Anastasius? Well, not much. Because if you read that dissertation, chapter 4, you'll know more than you want to know about how screwball Christians were. The basic upshot is this. Think of a world map where you've got Europe on the left and Russia on the right. And sort of the Mediterranean down at the bottom is the underbelly. Okay? At the time of Anastasius, because of all of the sectarian nonsense that went on, and because Odovacher has died here, Anastasius ends up being the only, for a little while, he ends up being the only emperor of the Roman Empire. But, by this point, you're looking at between 491 A.D. and 518 A.D., where our boy dies right in the middle. At that point, there was growing in the West, starting with Clovis, but you can maybe even posit it before then, the, the Gallic tribes. And then you got the Ostrogoths and the Visigoths and the Huns in the East and the Vandals, which are sort of like between them. Okay? They all got Romanized and they all got Christianized. And so there's an actual counter to Anastasius, but it's not really all that developed. Like you had Theodoric in the Balkans and he really kind of wanted to curry favor with both the Pope and Anastasius because what happened to the, the so-called barbarian tribes is as they they rubbed shoulders and elbows and sometimes invaded and raided Rome they became like Rome and at certain times the emperors were using them as mercenary troops against other enemies all right so they got Romanized and as they got Romanized they got Christianized and as they got Christianized they started to have like their own little areas of independence and at this point the Lombards are pretty much in control of Italy all right I'm not sure if they were even called Lombards at that point but they were they were technically speaking barbarian tribes and they were really pretty civilized because they were pro-Roman but they didn't want to have Rome rule over them but they were kind of pro-pope in Italy pro-con it went back and forth and we'll keep going back and forth from here on out so Anastasius you have to think of that whole you know again close your eyes and think of a map where you got Europe on the left and you got Russia on the right and you got the whole underbelly of the mad in between in Anastasius's mind that's his kingdom but it really isn't he don't really have that kind of power hold on he doesn't really have that kind of power and he knows that he's got to curry um, alliances with Theodoric in the north of him because you know he's right there on that isthmus on the Bosporus there you know where Turkey and um, the Middle East meet all right and Europe meet so you know that's at that little narrow narrow lip at the Black Sea where the Black Sea is 
and Russia then as now always wanted a warm water port so they've always been interested in Constantinople. Now Russia doesn't yet exist as Russia. There were some tribes there they were basically Viking nomads who were just starting up around that area. It's in 300 years they'll actually be a force but at this point they're not. They're just starting to experiment. And so Anastasia is looking really at the Balkans where the Goths are and where the, the Vandals are and the Huns are. And he's like, okay, I gotta make deals with these people. And then in the West he's got the he's got more Goths. You got the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths, and then you got um, you know, the other sort of Gallic tribes like that in the uh, what we call France and, and Britain. Okay? And he's trying to figure out, okay, well, what kind of alliances do I need to make so that I can keep the East, which was always more profitable, that's the Middle East, and then going toward Persia, and then going toward China. Because it was basically trade. The reason God put Israel where Israel is, is as a nexus of three continents so that you could vote with your feet to learn God if you wanted. And no matter where you are in the world, it would take, even back then, even 2,000 years prior to that, it would take you maybe a year, possibly two or three, to get to Israel from any place in the world. Okay? They've done experiments. Alan Alda used to have a, a, I forget what his series was, but Alan Alda used to have a series about ancient peoples. And, you know, when I grew up, it was, you know, the experiments of Thor Heiderall, because that was back in the 40s and 50s. And Alan Alda pl played with that. He said, oh, if you took a canoe and you left, say, North Carolina and you hugged the coast, how long would it take you to reach France? And I think it was like five months. From North Carolina, hugging the coast, going all the way north and coming back down to France, how long would it take? About five months. Okay? So... It, Israel was stuck there in the middle of three continents so people could vote with their feet. And that made Israel a very rich area. Well, Anastasius controls that area really well. Well, except for the religion problem, which is what we're going to deal with. He controls that area really well, and he controls most of the, the Middle East really well. Okay, and he's got some control over just the coastline pretty much everywhere else. And if you go look this up in Wikipedia, you'll see the maps and stuff. I'm trusting you to do some of this stuff on your own. So, the reason why this is such a terrible time, that basically, it, it's talking about everybody as if they're all unsaved. Because they're living as if they're unsaved. The Bible is a mystery to them. Okay? The reason why that's true is that Anastasius has to fight with and that's what chapter 4 of that dissertation covers. He has to fight with everybody all up in arms. And this is so petty, I can't even believe it. Everybody's up in arms over what is the definition of Jesus. Now remember I said this is in the anaphoric center? Everything comes out of it. Everything goes into it and it determines history. Yeah, well, see, that's what this boy was doing, fighting against his own brother. That's why. Over the definition of Jesus. How is he God-man? Well, I can understand that's a really important question to understand, but why would you go to war over it? With another human? You talk about it, and you might disagree a lot. But go to war? Yeah. You go to war if you don't know Bible. If you know Bible, then you're busy talking about Bible. If you don't know Bible, you go to war. And so this guy goes after his own brother over the definition of God. God-man in particular. And then he dies as a result of doing that before he even manages to do defeat his brother so his brother ends up inheriting everything that he fought okay so his brother didn't go to war his brother ends up the winner you get the message you get the little moral of the story okay but once his brother wins 
He wins Constans wins the West. The other brother remaining is Constantius II. He wins the East, and now Constans fought, it gets, it starts having a strain with his own brother over the same damn thing. What's the definition of Jesus Christ? Well, honey, if you got a problem with that, then you go and talk around, you do some research, ideally you study the Bible, because the Bible's real clear about it how Christ is God man it's not hard it's all displayed right there for you if you read it which they didn't clearly same thing with Trinity why why are people so confused about Trinity I've never understood those arguments as as being so I mean the the arguments don't make sense the problems they have with the idea of God man and God as Trinity doesn't make any sense. And the definitions they come up with are goofball on both sides. Alright, so Constans is going to fight with his brother Constantius too over the definition of Jesus Christ and he's going to commit troops and going to anathematize each other and blah 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 blah. It didn't quite get that far but it was going in that direction. So now God takes out Constans before he has a chance. And then ten years later, Constantius II, he dies because he was also on his way to kill his cousin, Julian, who was in the West because when Constans died in the West, there had to be a replacement. So that replacement was Julian, who was a Christian but didn't believe in Christ anymore, okay? And the troops around him liked Julian better than they liked Constantius. Yeah, who, who likes a religious person? They're dour. They're annoying. And they're stupid. We wouldn't know Bible if it pit them. But they're all romantically enamored of their own definition of the right thing. And if you don't agree with them, oh, you're a heretic. And then they feel real holy if they fight you. Now, fighting with words is a good thing. Fighting with weapons? What? Hello? The purpose of that is what? We're talking about definitions of God, how to worship God. What does the Bible say? There's no need, place, value to fighting with weapons over some idea about the Bible or God. Do you get that? Fight with the word. So if you're a Calvinist and the other one's a Catholic, instead of beating each other up like those two are going to end up doing later in history, same is going on here, then just argue the words with each other. That's iron sharpens iron and that's good. But commit troops and then use a sword? You're supposed to use the Bible, the sword of the word, not the sword that's you, you know made of steel. Hello. This is how dumb these people were, and it started back here. And it keeps on going. So as we get into our Day of the Lord center, it's not really the Day of the Lord, is it? But they think it is. Now, it's really important to keep harping on this. What I'm talking to you about right now happened back in the 350s AD, but it's still happening as I talk. The current version of what I'm talking about is happening right now in Russia. The people, the religious clerics who are backing Putin. This is what they want. It's the same deal. They're thinking the same way. They're a little more sophisticated about it now. But this is what they want, world domination for their version of Christianity. And the people behind Donald Trump are thinking the same way. The ones in Russia call themselves Third Rome. The ones behind Trump call themselves Seven Mountains. And I only see one organization that's exposing all this. And, he, and even they're not fully aware of how bad it is. And that's a, a, a group called RightWingWatch.org. And they think all Christianity is bupkis. Okay, fine. But they're exposing the Seven Mountains people. And they're exposing the Trump-Russia people. The Third Rome. 
you can Google on this. Better yet, go into YouTube and type in those things and hear those people talk in their own words. It's a takeover of the world plan. Just as it was back here. It hasn't changed. The names of the people have changed. The goals have not. And the stupidity and the ignorance of Bible has not changed. And we're talking now in 2017. And we've had the Bible all this time and we haven't learned anything till yet. And if you talk to anybody, especially the Catholics or the Calvinists or anybody in mainstream Christianity about the so-called church fathers and about Constantine himself, they praise him. But God didn't. Abominations. Constantine died in the midst of the word abominations. And Paul, and uh, um, John is playing on Paul. Paul had um, Constantine die in the middle of Proel Picotas in Ephesians 1.12, which means first fruits. And Constantine died on Pentecost, which in the Bible is called first fruits. 50th day of the Omer which the Jews don't count right today. Alright, that's first fruits. Christ our first fruits. Because he rose on the first day of first fruits. That's when you start counting the Omer. And on the 50th day, that's supposed to represent Jubilee. Okay? And the 50th day, which we call Pentecost, they call it 50th day of first fruits in the Bible. That's abominations here. And first fruits is the word that Paul used and has our boy um, Constantine die right in the middle of it at Proel. So he didn't make first fruits. In other words, it's a snub. It's a condemnation of Constantine both in, in Ephesians 1 and here. And there are other condemnations that are used in Matthew 24 and uh, Luke 21 and Mark 13 but I don't remember what they are off the top of my head so when you come down to this point Constantine's sons and it just keeps on going and then finally remember you got the Council of Chalcedon which is where all that religious warring comes to a head the East and the West break the Council of Chalcedon is basically the East saying to the West your Pope, that your pope has no power over us We'll do, we'll do it our way. And then within their own realm, the northern part of Byzantium was um, saying that Christ had two natures. And the southern part of the Byzantium was saying, well, Christ is really one nature. And the Council of Chalcedon pronounced those saying Christ is one nature as heretics. And then persecuted them, big time. That's going on in Russia right now. They're persecuting everybody who isn't Russian Orthodox. You're not going to see it in the news because Putin has a tight li you know, lid on TV and media and all that. So this is current as well as it is way in the past. All right, And the outcome of the Council of Chalcedon was you had these two sides. The North versus the South in Byzantium. And Anastasius ends up being part of the South. He comes to the throne, and because of Zeno having said, okay, look, north, south, let's forget this. Let's have the Hanoticon. We're just going to agree on the part we agree on, which, yes, Christ is begotten by Father. And actually, the Greek word doesn't mean begotten. It means uniquely sired, uniquely born. Monognes. It's in John 3.16. They agreed on that one. And how does it work? Is he two natures, or two persons, or two wells, or one well, or what? Well, Zeno didn't, Zeno Sanoticon made it illegal. This is where he went wrong. He made it illegal to talk about it. That way the South could say, well, he's one nature. And the North could say, well, he's two natures and one person. Okay. He should have, he should have just said, hi, Freedom of religion, you believe what you want, but he didn't. So this guy comes to power and he's, he tries to do it Zeno's way because 
this guy is married to Zeno's wife, who's now a widow. And Zeno's kids started to rule and then died within a year. And Anastasius takes the throne. She marries, she marries him, actually. Um, it wasn't Zeno's kid, I'm sorry. It was Zeno died. And she was married to Zeno, and the next guy would have been Zeno's brother, and the people didn't like him, so they picked Anastasius instead. But Anastasius was part of the, the crowd that believed in the southern idea of Christ, which is that he's one nature. And he somehow, he was really human, but he somehow magically got all at the same time. And then they all differed within each other as to how he was magically God. And then some of, they called it monophysite or miophysite. And some of the Miophysite and some of the Monophysite, they all excommunicated each other. Or they all t wouldn't, the, the trick was, they wouldn't eat communion together. I'm not going to eat communion with you because you don't believe in God the same way I do. Huh? Where does it say to do that in the Bible? 1 Corinthians 1 says don't do that. Go look it up. Paul mocks this kind of stuff. Where even in Paul's day, one was saying, Well, I belong to Paul. And another was saying, I belong to Barnabas. And another was saying, I belong to Cephas, Peter. And Paul is saying, What? You don't belong to us. Did we pay for your sins? No, you belong to Christ. You're all in Christ. Are there right doctrines and wrong doctrines? Of course. But you're a believer. Because you believed he paid for your sins. And whatever else you believe, honey, that's right or wrong. It's something to learn and something to get corrected on. But you're a believer. I'm a believer. Do we agree with each other? No. Do we have to agree with each other? No. And the person who converted me to Christ versus the person who converted you to Christ? Can you be more stupid than that to differentiate? That's what's going on here. Well, Anastasius was with the crowd that said, well, Christ is one nature. So he didn't like the Council of Chalcedon, but now he's emperor and he's got to try to unite the whole Byzantine Empire. And he wants to sort of get along with the Pope in Italy too, because half of his empire likes that Pope. So he tries to hold it together. Now think again of that map. In the West, you got what we call France and Britain. They called it Gaul. And a bunch of other names. Okay, based on the old Roman names. And in the East, you got at your border Persia. All right? Persia is Zoroastrianism or whatever else they are. They're not Christian. They got Christians living in it, but they're not Christian. So at this point, and it's particularly bad right in here. Anastasius doesn't want, doesn't want to alienate the southern believers who happen to believe the same way he does anyhow. But he also doesn't want to alienate the northern believers because if he does, then that's going to encourage the Goths or the, or the Huns or the Vandals or somebody to come and attack him. At the same time, if he alienates the southern believers, no matter what he believes, then that's going to encourage, and it did, the Persians to attack him. So this whole period is about all of the clerics on both sides fighting with each other and trying to get Anastasius in the middle. And one side, either whether it's the Pope or somebody else, calling him a heretic, and the other side is calling those who called him a heretic, a heretic. And this poor guy is stuck here in the middle. What kind of rebirth is that? What kind of resurrection is that? That's the characteristic of what happens between two 490 benchmarks. This one being the benchmark 490 from his birth, and this being the benchmark and the 490 from his death. And honey, that is exactly where we are today. Today. The 490 from his birth. Remember I did this? I didn't do it as cleanly as I should have. But I'm doing it now. 
490 from his birth is 490. That's obviously once. We're now in 2000. So if I multiply it four times. 1960 was the fourth 490 from his birth. Okay? That is when the Christians became the foolish virgins in Matthew 25 10. I've already done the videos on that earlier in the playlist. That's the exact year that they did that. Alright? 490 times 12 again. I mean 4 again. Plus 30 to benchmark at his death is 1990. And that's when Russia fell. You beginning to understand where we are? It's the same damn thing. And we're going through religious war now. We're just not yet fighting with weapons, and hopefully we won't. But all the same arguments and the same self-righteousness and the same ba da ba da ba da with the people behind Donald Trump having elected him being those people, just like the people who were bugging Anastasius. Except Trump couldn't care less. He doesn't, he doesn't even know how to spell Bible. All right, but they got him in power. And they're jockeying for power, seven heads and ten hearts around him. Same thing with Putin. So this, what you've just seen, is going through what happens in a 490. When you're between the 490 after Christ's birth and the 490 after Christ's death. And in our case, contiguous, that's 1990. All right? And remember I said there's more reconciliation than that? Because John's doing it four different ways, five different ways. He's got this one, which I haven't explained yet fully, this one, and this one. And I'll explain more about that in the next increment. But as far as Anastasius goes, just know that the whole time, from here all the way to like halfway through Bleppo, if I could get it to just go halfway through, to that point. His whole life was characterized by the battle of the fighting prelates all over the place from the west in Gaul all the way through Persia and all at the underbelly of northern Africa and the Middle East. That was his life and it didn't work. And finally at the end in 518 when he dies because it never got solved. Right here, this, this at Bleppo, everybody's going to see him die. But he ain't seeing nothing because he's dead. And in that year, just like maybe a couple months before he died, he sent the Pope in Italy a final letter saying, I don't agree with you. We're not going with you. We repudiate this Council of Chalcedon. And he burnt it. He destroyed it. It was a bunch of legal documents he destroyed. Okay? So he said no and then died. Almost immediately. Alright? To the Pope who was in Italy then, and I forget the guy's name. Okay? That's how it ended for Anastasius. That's how it begins for Justin the First who's going to be in a, a couple of later increments. I'm not going to start on Justin right away. So, just know, see, this was the end. This is 526 when Justin dies. This is 518. I'm not taking you to 526 yet because i got to show you some math in the next increment. But for now, this is how Anastasius dies. Repudiating, the completing the rift between East and West. Anastasis did that. And that's why this language is so bad. Because it's everybody excommunicating everybody else. Ending with resurrection. Okay. Excommunicating the Pope. Peace out.